This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Stay until the end to learn how Squarespace can help you build your online identity in business. What's up, Solo Cups? My name is John Solo, and I want to be the first person to congratulate you on finding the best part of the internet. This is Messed Up Origins, the show where I take your favorite childhood stories and break down the convoluted, often horrifying history behind their creation. Normally, that involves some kind of human sacrifice, heartbreak, or death on a massive scale, but today is an exception to that rule because we are talking about a little ditty known as Mary Had a Little Lamb. Now, you're probably thinking, Mary Had a Little Lamb is one of the most metal songs in history, right up there with Pulse of the maggots. What do you mean its origins aren't messed up? And trust me when I say I was truly surprised when I looked up the poem's history and discovered there wasn't a version where Mary sacrifices the lamb to Satan. That being said, the lineage of Mary Had a Little Lamb is still an interesting one that is filled with controversy. Not only are there two separate women claiming to have ties to the poem's creation, for some reason Henry Ford, yes, that Henry Ford, throws his hat in the ring to settle the matter once and for all. If you haven't yet, be sure to give that like button some love and subscribe to have more content like this in your sub box on a regular basis. And now let's jump into the weird and wild history this episode has in store. So if you were raised in America, chances are you're pretty familiar with this poem already. But for those who were born elsewhere or who just don't sing the song on a regular basis, here was the original complete version that was published back in 1830. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. He followed her to school one day. That was against the rule. It made the children laugh and play to see a lamb at school. And so the teacher turned him out, but still he lingered near and waited patiently about till Mary did appear. And then he ran to her and laid his head upon her arm as if he said, I'm not afraid, you'll keep me from all harm. What makes the lamb love Mary so, the eager children cry? Oh, Mary loves the lamb, you know, the teacher did reply. And you each gentle animal in confidence may bind and make them follow at your call if you are always kind. Ah, see how they turned the funny poem into a lesson about being kind to animals? Weren't expecting that, were ya? Wait a minute, this game is educational. <gasps> I'll teach you to teach me. So according to the official record, that was the original Mary Had a Little Lamb nursery rhyme. Only back then, it went by a different name. When it was first published back in 1830, the poem was titled Mary's Lamb and was one of the 15 educational rhymes included in Sarah Joseph Hale's Poems for Our Children. Now, some important context for those unfamiliar with Sarah and her work, she was a pretty badass lady. Besides receiving a modicum of formal education from her older brother who attended Dartmouth, she was homeschooled entirely by her mother. But that didn't stop her from making waves in the world of the written word. In addition to being one of the primary voices behind the movement to make Thanksgiving a national holiday and allegedly being the one who convinced Abraham Lincoln to proclaim it as such, she was also the editor of the first women's magazine in the United States called Godey's Lady Book. Now when she took that job as editor back in 1828, she left her hometown of Newport, New Hampshire and moved to Boston. It was there she met a dude named Lowell Mason. He was a young musician and composer who was working hard to get music education incorporated into America's school system. Both he and Hale had a strong belief that simple children's poems set to music could be used to teach positive Christian morals to kids that would help them grow into productive, upstanding citizens. Therefore, Hale took it upon herself to write the aforementioned collection, Poems for Our Children, in which Mary's Lamb was included, and Mason wrote simple melodies to accompany each poem. What I found to be pretty fascinating, though, is that the melody Mason wrote for Mary's Lamb was not the same as the one that most people sing nowadays. And I actually managed to find that original sheet music in a polar bear cave deep in the heart of the Amazon and commissioned someone to play it on the piano for you. So here's what Mary's Lamb would have sounded like if you were to hear it in the early 1830s. The version we're familiar with doesn't come along for another few years when Mason decided to remix the melody to fit the chorus of a minstrel tune called Goodnight Ladies. It's also believed that that's where the repeating lines were introduced. So instead of singing Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, you would repeat the last three syllables of the first line before finishing off the pair. If you want to hear the song that inspired this change, there's a kids channel called Muffin Songs that recorded their own version complete with terrifying animated children. Link is in my sources section. Now in the 1850s, not even 
been two full decades after its publication and subsequent remix, Mary's Lamb and a number of Hale and Mason's other works were being published in school books nationwide, and as a result, the poem became very well known among America's youth. But I'm sure there's a few of you wondering at this point, why? As in, why did Sarah Josepha Hale decide to write a poem about a girl who takes her pet sheep to school? Well, according to a biography about her written in 1985 called Sarah Josepha Hale, a New England pioneer, she was inspired by a real incident that occurred while she was teaching back in Newport. The way Hale told it, she was surprised to see one of her students, who may or may not have been named Mary, enter class with a lamb following at her side. At first, she tried ignoring it, but as anyone who's been a middle schooler would expect, the lamb was a huge distraction for the class and had to be sent outside. The lamb didn't go too far though. Apparently it hung out on the property until school was dismissed and as soon as Mary stepped outside it ran up to her looking for all the love and affection it was deprived of throughout the day. When the kids wanted to know why the lamb was so enamored with its owner, Sarah used the opportunity to teach them a lesson. That because Mary loved it and treated it right, the lamb loved her back. And she said if they took care of their own animals like she did, they would be met with the same affection. This interaction is what supposedly inspired the last verse of the poem, and you each gentle animal and confidence may bind and make them answer to your call if you are always kind. So that is the official story behind the creation of Mary Had a Little Lamb. And the reason I say official is that if you were to look up the poem in an encyclopedia, or dare I say Wikipedia, you'll find Sarah Josepha Hale listed as the author. That being said, there's some controversy surrounding its origins due to the claims of one Mary Sawyer, and we're going to unpack her side of the story next. So here's where the story gets weird. Because in the last section, we've got this neat little timeline where all the pieces fit together perfectly. You can clearly see the poem evolving into the version we know today. And most importantly, there is evidence to back up Sarah Hale's authorship. But in this section, there's Mary Sawyer, who didn't have a single shred of evidence, yet was somehow able to convince a considerable amount of people that she was the Mary from the poem. So let me start it from the beginning. When she was 70 years old, Sawyer claimed that back in 1815, when she was nine years old, she found a lamb who was abandoned by its mother, and after nursing it back to health, it got extremely attached to her. One day, at the recommendation of her older brother, she let the lamb follow her to school and tried her best to hide the adorable little creature under her desk. However, Mary's plan fell through when she walked to the front of the classroom to recite something, and the lamb followed her up there. Now, according to Mary, the day that happened, there was an older student visiting her school, John Rulestone, who was the nephew of the school's reverend. Some sources claim that he was helping teach Mary's class, and others say that he was studying for college with the reverend, a pretty common practice for that time. Either way, he found the incident with the lamb to be pretty funny, and a few days later, he personally rode his horse to Mary's school to give her a piece of paper that had the poem's first 12 original lines on it. Allegedly, she went on to share this poem with her friends and family, and from there, it was passed on to other folks living in the area until just about everybody had heard the tale of Mary and her little lamb. Again, this is a cool story, and it actually does fit in the timeline we established last section because Sarah Hale didn't publish her book of children's stories until 1830, 15 years years after the alleged incident when Mary was 24. And Mary claimed that when she learned the poem had been published, she just figured that someone had expanded on the verses Rulestone gave her, which isn't unrealistic. As it just so happens, Mary's hometown of Sterling, Massachusetts is only about 90 miles away from Sarah Hale's hometown of Newport, New Hampshire, where she also claimed to have taught the student that brought the lamb to school. Now that's not exactly a short distance for those days, but throughout this series, we've seen plenty of stories travel a lot further than that. And if John Rulestone's poem was as popular in Mary's hometown as she claims, it wouldn't shock me if it made its way north to where Sarah Hale could have heard it. That being said, the reason I doubt it is, just to reiterate, Mary had no evidence to support her claim. The original piece of paper that Rulestone supposedly gave her was lost decades before she went public with the story at the age of 70, and Rulestone himself was never able to speak on the matter because he tragically passed away when he was a freshman at Harvard only a few years after his run-in with Mary and her lamb. Regardless of whether or not Mary is telling the truth though, the folks at Sterling, Massachusetts are happy to celebrate her as their hometown hero. There's actually a two-foot-tall bronze statue and historical marker representing Mary's lamb that proudly stands at the center of town, and the house she grew up in was preserved for over a century until it was destroyed by arson in August of 2007. But to top it all off, and in my opinion, this is the strangest part of the whole debacle, the Henry Ford was so convinced by Mary's story that in the 1920s, he took it upon himself to purchase the school the incident occurred in and move it to Sudbury, Massachusetts, which he tried and failed to turn into a themed historical village. But the madness doesn't stop there, my friends, because in 1928, he released a 60-page book making his case for Mary Sawyer being the inspiration for the poem. 
Now I've got to say, while I'm still not convinced after reading Ford's book, he does make some interesting arguments. Like the difference in writing style when you compare the first 12 lines of the poem with the rest, and the fact that the moral lesson Hale included seems kind of forced into the story. To inject my opinion into it though, I've read about a dozen stories from back in the day that could be described the exact same way. I mean, the whole point of stories and poems for kids is to reel them in with a fun and catchy premise before teaching them a lesson, and that's exactly what Sarah Hale's version does. That doesn't mean that somebody else wrote the first half. Call me crazy, I just think it's a little too bold to claim this renowned literary figure plagiarized her most well-known work because some woman claimed that she was the inspiration for it 60 years after the event supposedly happened. I mean, if 2020, the year of cancel culture, has taught us anything, it's that well-respected people are totally capable of shady behavior, so maybe Hale was being disingenuous when she said that she had a student who inspired the story, but again, I'm not totally comfortable making those claims based on what is ultimately hearsay. Especially when the person who was most adamant about Mary Sawyer's claims being true had a lot to gain from it. I mean, his book is just as much a promotion of her story as it is the historical village he planned on making a tourist attraction. To paraphrase what one of my sources said, the dude wasn't as much a historian as he was a businessman. Not to mention, it was also surprisingly common for students back then to have lambs follow them to school, especially when they lived in farm communities. I learned in my research that sheep apparently do not make very good mothers and abandon their babies on a regular basis. And because farmers are a little too busy to take care of the younglings, which require constant nourishment and affection, that responsibility would fall on their kids. Their children, I mean, not baby goats. I felt like I should make that clear due to the subject matter. But then the lambs would get attached to their young caretakers who they perceived as their mothers and would follow them wherever they went. So even if Mary Sawyer was telling the truth, chances are she wasn't the only student at that time who had the experience described in the poem. I will admit, it's kind of suspect that the girl in the poem's name is also Mary, but remember what I said earlier. Hale and Mason wanted to teach students good Christian values, and Mary is about as Christian as a girl's name can get, so it makes sense that she would pick that name for the character. In the end though, it's your call who you want to believe, and I know it's fun to root for the underdog, but if you want to rely on physical evidence and recorded history as opposed to complete conjecture, you're going to have to join me on Team Hale. It's just as well anyway, because according to a letter Mary Sawyer wrote to a family friend, her lamb lived to about four years old and gave birth to a few babies of its own before being gored to death by a cow. Yep, just when you thought we'd finish an episode without something being violently killed. Then again, if nobody dies a painful death, was it really a messed up origin? That I will leave for you to decide in the comments as well as the origin story that you liked best. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, a website, or an online store, make it with Squarespace. Now chances are you already know about Squarespace because they've been empowering creators around the world for years. They are the platform to use for building your online identity and business and that's because they make the process so simple. Everything you need to get started is right on their website. There's never anything to download, patch, install, or upgrade ever. It can all be done right in your browser and the interface is incredibly easy to use. So much so that I made my website messeduporiginscom through Squarespace. They also have award-winning customer service that's available 24 seven. So if you do need some guidance, they'll be right there to help you with whatever you need. I know, it sounds too good to be true, but it's really not. With the wide variety of tools Squarespace offers and how smooth they make the design process, it has never been easier to build a website. So if you want to give it a shot and figure out why everyone loves Squarespace so much, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your free trial. Then when you're ready to launch your masterpiece, use code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Welcome back, Solo fam. Now let's say goodbye. In all seriousness, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for watching today's episode. If you enjoyed it and want to support what I do here on the channel, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to have more messed up content like this delivered to your sub box every single week. Also remember to follow me on social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I know the self-promotion is annoying, but those really are the best ways to stay updated on messed up origins news. And it's a great backup for YouTube's half broken notification system. Then if you still haven't gotten enough, feel free to follow my little lamb on Instagram. His fleece is definitely not as white as snow, but his chest hair is, and that should count for some Something, right? I'll see you folks again next week with some very special messed up content that you'll find very fitting for the Halloween season. Until then though, my name is John Solo and remember, John shot first.